Chris, to the uh, third installment of our marriage enrichment series on sexuality and intimacy. As usual, we'll give just a minute or two so that everyone can kind of join, audio can connect, etc. But today we're going to jump right in. Today is probably our most full presentation. Um, as usual, I'm going to open this up in prayer. We're going to have a break halfway through to give people the chance to stretch the legs. We'll have a couple of questions that people can explore as well. There is sometimes a second break that we've done, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to share the questions for that break for you know couples to explore or discuss at their leisure, perhaps at another time. But I do want everyone to you know go to bed at some point this evening, so we'll try to stay on track. Um, all right. So I think we're good. All right, so I'm going to start us off in prayer as usual. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for this opportunity to come together to really have the opportunity to reflect on the gift of marriage and the vocation that you've called us to. Lord, today we're going to explore a topic that I know is near and dear to your heart. I ask that you would guide this presentation, that as always, you would open our hearts and our minds to receive whatever pieces of wisdom, insight, whatever nudging of the Holy Spirit um, all of us are called to. Give us, as always, the strength and the grace to live these things out in our relationship. And like good seeds planted, Lord, as we go forth from this evening, please continue to grow and foster in us the virtues that are needed. Let me pray all of this in your holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So tonight is the much anticipated sexuality and intimacy talk. And as we all know, these are big, big topics. And if you ask most people if they think they really understand these two areas, they'll probably get an uncomfortable pause, nervous laugh, confused blank stare, more uncomfortable pause, maybe a few honest no's. But even from that percentage of ones who think they understand these things, how many of their perspectives were shaped by the popular culture, media, peers, painful experiences versus, well, the author and creator of sexuality and intimacy? We say there's movies about these things, songs about it, commercials, billboards, channels, endless literature. But for something so talked about, something that inundates our world so much, it feels like we should have a better grasp on it, no? People are fascinated by it. They crave it, they long for it, pursue it. Locker rooms are talking about it. But again, do they really understand it? How do we find true intimacy? And what is it? What is the purpose of sex? And even if I feel like I understand the purpose of sex, how do I translate that to my relationship? How do I keep it? How do I make it better? What is the highest level of sexual fulfillment that I can achieve? Like I said, these are big questions. And to be quite honest, the answers to these questions are a big reason that I am proud to be Catholic. I'll share honestly that I have counseled many couples in secular settings as well. And I liken trying to fix intimacy and sexual issues within a relationship without God, without faith, and without his design and desire for us weighing into the conversation as sort of like trying to put together a piece of Ikea furniture without directions, tools, and maybe without any idea of what the piece of furniture you're actually assembling is. So not even really understanding what it's supposed to look like when you're done. Even worse, maybe you have a picture of a bed or a dresser in mind, but the pieces you have are meant to be a desk. 
As you can imagine, this leads to a lot of confusion, frustration, doubt, and in a relationship, ultimately pain. We talk about the ache of the gap. When whether there's an awareness or even conscious understanding, there's a pain from something not being where on some level, we know it's meant to be, or at least has the potential to be. It has this feeling of missing something, of not being enough, restlessness. It leaves this sense of this can't be it. And again, into the beauty of our faith. It's like someone handing you the directions and saying, yes, you're right, that is not it. And then directing you to the tools you need to help begin actually building. Now, I don't know how many of you have made IKEA furniture, even with tools and directions, that's not exactly a Saturday project I would label as fun or easy. But it's a good feeling when you know you're headed somewhere and making progress when you can see and understand the steps and have a vision for what you're working towards. This is what we want the journey towards fulfilling intimacy and sex to be like. In my pursuit with God, it's a real possibility. We say he is not confused on these things. He's so passionate about it because he made them. He has the patent, he knows the design. And he has every intention of doing everything needed to help us build into our marriages, healthy intimacy and sexuality. So today is meant to be a little bit like looking at those original blueprints. It's talking about and really exploring the purpose, meaning and definitions of these key areas according to our faith, which is authored by God. Now we'll also get into how our nature is fallen, meaning it's literally impossible for us to achieve or do these things on our own. So as usual, we'll hit upon some of the problem spots, meaning where our humanity tends to miss the mark. But then we'll move on to tips, skills, and resources for following Bob the Builder's amazing example and building away in our marriage to the best of our ability. So we're going to start today with intimacy, how this then affects the definition of a real relationship, then touch upon intimacy builders and killers, as well as emotional needs. Then we'll move on to sex, dun, dun, dun. going very briefly over theology of the body, then talking about the power of sex, five stages of sexual advancement, sex differences for men and women, and overcoming the sex gap. We will close with exploring the church's teaching in regard to some hot topics of our time in this area. And in order to do this, we'll really have to get into how we define the purpose of sex and then how this shapes our church's view and teaching on both contraception and pornography. All right, but to kick us off, let's start with intimacy which tends to be this word that we use a lot. But again, as we said at the start, what does it actually mean? And for our purposes, we certainly want to look at how we define intimacy from a Catholic perspective. And a good working definition is the mutual self-revelation that allows us to know and be known. Intimacy is the mutual sharing of the journey to fulfill our life purpose which is to become the best version of ourselves. We talked about at the very beginning, how our essential purpose, the purpose of our life, is to become who God authentically created us to be, which is always, as Matthew Kelly likes to say, the best version of ourselves. A person who is fully loved by God and able to love fully. A saint in her own unique personal way. And I think sometimes this idea makes people uncomfortable because you say saint and people can automatically picture their second grade prayer card with a stoic statue-like painting, eyes up, halo glow, crucifix in arms. But really, a saint, we say, is simply a sinner who cares, a sinner who's trying. That's it. So when we say saint, please picture you with God. 
And every time you try to be the best person you can be in any given moment, doesn't matter what that looks like, that is you living holiness. That is you becoming the completely unique, one of a kind, can't be repeated or replaced you saint. And so what this definition of intimacy is saying is that sharing and joining in on that process with another is intimacy. Intimacy is also a need. You can survive without it, but you can't thrive. And you certainly cannot make that journey towards heaven successfully without it. We were made for a relationship and our growth depends upon this kind of connection. Another way of saying it is that God has planted the steps of our salvation within other. So spiritual progression requires encounter, sharing of self, and it requires a lot of intimacy. Now, intimacy requires that we allow another person to discover all of this, everything, which is why we use the little acronym up top, into me, be. I want all of me to be seen, heard, understood, accepted, and loved. And I can only experience intimacy to the degree that I am known or exposed. I often use the example of two big circle magnets. If you stick those two things together, there's just a natural strong connection that happens for any of you who have joined a preschool or kindergarten class before. But if I were to start putting things on the surface, maybe tape or pieces of wood, the two might still stick together, but the connection is not going to be as strong. And this is what leads us to the seven levels of intimacy. The more surface area that's exposed and shared with another, the stronger the connection. So our level of intimacy is determined by the degree to which I'm sharing myself and exposing my whole self, my whole magnet. Now, of course, we can only experience perfect, complete intimacy with God who knows our entire being from the beginning. And we're absolutely called to discern the relationships that are safe and healthy to progress in intimacy, sharing of ourselves. But hopefully in a marriage, we are shooting for that highest possible level, even in our humanness. Now, as we go through these seven levels, I want you to imagine a magnet that has more and more surface area revealed. Also, keep in mind how a couple could, over time, whether consciously or unconsciously, slip down in their level of intimacy. Sometimes it's because of life, logistics, kids, overcrowded schedules. Couples may even be operating like a team and not necessarily arguing, but they're no longer sharing the level of connection that they once felt. Think about the progression of a relationship between two people and how it gets deeper and stronger. But also think about what a couple would look like or sound like if they sank down into the shallow end. You can almost feel how conversations and interactions would become more empty. A void could appear and areas of those magnets could be covered or become dusty or hidden over time. So many couples in counseling use the phrase, something is missing from our relationship. And oftentimes, again, whether they realize it or not, the thing that's missing is intimacy. All right, so quick trip through the seven levels, starting with level one, cliches. So the first level is impersonal. It involves the right amount of small talk to make people feel comfortable. Hi, hello, how are you? It's useful for day-to-day -day transactions, but really this level is supposed to simply be the groundwork for making initial connections with people. Leading to level two, which is going to be facts. And this can be lower level impersonal facts, such as current events, the weather, those nationals, or it can be higher level impersonal facts. So, a discussion on the life of Abraham Lincoln or what causes a tsunami. And in a couple, it could also be simply exchanging information. So Brian's ride to soccer will be here at 11. We need more Malcolm. 
Personal facts are the last category in this level, i.e. facts about you. And this is the bridge to the next level of opinions. In level three, you are revealing more about yourself, how you think, what are your beliefs, but also hopefully receiving this from others and offering the gift of acceptance. Acceptance is really what allows intimacy to be built in this stage as opposed to World War III's. So knowing how, when, and why to agree to disagree gracefully and how to do this in a way that brings life into our relationship versus destroying trust or creating rest. Another crucial ingredient for this level is humility. So the right understanding of my own fallible nature, the fact that I don't know it all, I don't have all the answers. This is what leads to acceptance of those with differing opinions and my ability to hold space for people whose opinions differ from mine. Rather than pushing them to be someone else, probably someone more like me. Trust me, the world can only handle one Rebecca and one of you. All right, level four is hopes and dreams. So our dreams reveal a lot about us. What do we care about? What matters to us? What are our deepest desires? Knowing what brings passion, energy, enthusiasm to the lives of those we love. And me knowing that my spouse knows these things about me as well. And as a result, cares about them too. Love in this level involves a willingness to understand and support these things, as well as at some point, delaying gratification in order to support each other's dreams. This sacrifice is what builds more connection that can lead to level five of feelings. So my emotional reactions, exploring how we really feel about people, places, things, events. And this usually requires being vulnerable. What's necessary for intimacy in this level is learning to express in healthy ways for ourselves without being hurtful to another. Hence our whole long communication talk from our last session. As we discussed, allowing those we love to express their feelings, to be truly heard, listened to, it shows investment and it shows respect. It's a key factor for creating and protecting this level. Now, level six is one of my favorites because it's one that tends to be overlooked completely. And this is faults, fears, and failures. In this level, I can show you even my messiness. Later on, we're gonna talk about the cycle of use, where what matters to me is as if you are valued to me. Meaning I love you in as much as you serve my needs, I benefit or it helps my greater good. This level of intimacy directly opposes and fights back against that love counterfeit. Because it says here you are safe enough to make mistakes to be imperfect, to be unsure of yourself, to mess up even if it inconveniences me. And because we are human, these weaknesses are a big part of our magnet. I don't think most of us would think of covering or hiding our faults and failures as blocking intimacy, but it does. A child doesn't learn about unconditional love when they get straight A's or win the soccer game. Think about it. It's when they mess up big time and you still love them. Same concept in our marriage. And if you can imagine our relationship with God, if we believe that he loved us only when and if we were perfect. I can because sadly I see it all the time. People think, well, I'm pretty messed up, so that's not going to happen. I guess I'll let him run the universe and try to stay off his lightning radar. It's really the fact that we are so weak, flawed. We all know those moments where we run straight into our humanity and it's not pretty. 
guys may remember me mentioning from a previous session, a mentor who used to describe it as, I have seen myself for what I really am, and I am not amused. And yet, God still loves us and wants to be with us. He's so crazy about this whole mess. Lord only knows why. That's what creates a deep, profound, unconditional love. And we do our best to recreate this in our marriages. All right, last but not least, level seven is legitimate needs. So here is where I take on your needs as my own. We say the definition of love is to will the good of the other, meaning I now want, desire, and work towards your good as much as I do my own. And your good includes all of your needs, everything that's necessary for you to thrive. And again, become the best version of yourself. And it's from this understanding of intimacy that a new definition of a relationship begins to emerge. Once again, so many definitions out there, but we have the blessing of a deeper understanding. Here, the mutual fulfilling of legitimate needs is the pinnacle of a relationship. A relationship is about helping someone else to holiness and receiving the support that you need to do the same. In other words, to love a person means to do everything within your power to help that person become their you saint and never do anything that would hinder him from achieving this great essential purpose. The very idea of authentic relationship also presupposes that you would never ever take pleasure or selfish fulfillment at the other person's expense. Especially since relationships are not about getting what we want. In fact, I do can be translated to, I will never ever have it my way ever again. From here on out, it's our way, our wants, our collective good. Now, in trying to make that journey and grow our intimacy, there are going to be certain things that are going to kill the process as well as good things that like the right ingredients in a Petri dish will help it to grow. So we'll start with the intimacy killers and those are going to be avoiding conflict. So conflict is 100% unavoidable when two different human beings are joining their lives. And it's actually incredibly necessary. It's so essential to knowing and being known. Also, avoiding it usually involves hiding those opinions, feelings, or worse, legitimate needs. Next is dishonesty. You can't have intimacy without authenticity and trust. Lack of acceptance is, again, not holding space for my spouse. So it's sending a message of conditional love, which is not what we are made for. Lack of quality time. So we need time and space to share our life with each other. Those things actually are the Petri dish from which we, the environment from which we're able to grow intimacy. Lastly, lack of amends and forgiveness. So hurts are like holes in our magnet. Amends and forgiveness are needed to fill them both up. Both of which we will go more into in our next session. So again, all of these things are either going to cover up a part of our magnet or create an environment where it doesn't feel safe for one to expose certain areas of their own. All right, well, what about the things that build up intimacy? Definitely the goal. How do we help ourselves stay at or reach that highest level? Well, first is prioritizing that quality time. So make your Petri dish and make it a priority. Date nights, prayer time, activities together, setting and building into your schedule one-on-one time. I think it was C.S. Lewis who had an expression, but first things first and second things will benefit. Put second things first and then first things and second things will suffer, not benefit. Meaning, put your marriage first. This 
I promise you will benefit all of your second things, your job, your kids, your friends, your extended family. Marriage is the priority, not because we are so self-absorbed with each other, but because we are the foundation from which everything else grows. It's like if I have the two main sides of my desk. Without those being sturdy, I can't really build or anchor the shelves or the drawers. As we said earlier, so often those higher levels of intimacy are not being reached because there's a lot of other things that have taken over. These things are important, but it's so key to see investing in your marriage first is actually the best way to honor, support, and keep healthy all of those other important things. Also, in that quality time, allowing space for communication. Like we talked about last session, time for noodling it out, doing check-ins, and working through those unavoidable conflicts. Next, we have identifying your spouse's emotional needs and then working to address all of those needs. And if you're thinking in your mind, you're asking what exactly are emotional needs. Well, I'm so glad you asked because here it comes. We talk about in counseling the concept of legitimate needs and how they cover four areas, emotional, spiritual, intellectual, and physical. Sometimes the picture we give is it's almost like the four legs of a table that help keep it balanced and steady and standing. And we really need to be working on growth in all four areas. Without any of them, the table of our relationship will become off balance. The emotional needs are one of the legs of this table. And one of our resources for this week is a book called His Needs, Her Needs. And in it, 10 main emotional needs are identified. It also separates the needs that most women rate as the highest and likewise for the men. So as I go through these 10, again, see if you can guess. So we'll start with affection, which is show, showing care through words, cards, gifts, hugs, kisses, and courtesy. Creating an environment that clearly and repeatedly expresses care and interest as well as pursuit. Next is sexual fulfillment. So a sexual relationship that brings life to the marriage and is enjoyable, bonding, and creates intimacy. Intimate conversation is talking about the events of the day, feelings, and plans. Showing interest in your favorite topics of conversation balancing conversation, and giving your undivided attention. Recreational companionship is developing interest in each other's favorite activities, joining in on these activities, and if needed, negotiating new ones that are mutually enjoyable. Then we have honesty and openness, revealing positive and negative feelings and opinions, not leaving the other with any false impressions, and answering questions truthfully. Physical attractiveness does not mean being a supermodel. It means making an effort to be attractive to your spouse. So keeping healthy and clean as much as possible with diet, exercise, making an effort, wearing things that you know the other will find attractive. Financial support is provision of financial resources to create an acceptable standard of living, avoiding working hours of travel that's unacceptable or creates difficulties. Domestic support, creation of a home environment that offers a refuge from the stresses of life, managing the home, helping with chores, house cleaning, and maintenance. Family commitment, is scheduling sufficient time and energy for the raising and healthy development of the family, being involved. Admiration, respecting, valuing, and appreciating your spouse, avoiding criticism, and expressing admiration and respect clearly and often. So the items in the left column are the top ones for women, and the ones on the right are the top ones for men. 
again, not across the board, but well over 80% majority of the time. And this book is actually an inventory where you can do as a couple to identify the ones that are most meaningful to you and to your spouse. It allows you to also assess areas that may feel neglected and identify steps to help build that up. And again, I'll show that book at the end. But for now, we have come to our first little break and set of questions. Again, we're just going to take a quick four to five minutes. Feel free to stretch, get something to eat or drink. But if you would like as a couple, feel free to also take a look and maybe go over some of these questions. Again, you can also take a pause and set a coffee date or another time to go over them. But the first question is, looking at the list of intimacy killers and builders, what do you think your relationship could use more of or less of? Are there any intimacy killers that are affecting the level of intimacy you want to have? Looking at the list of emotional needs, this is the second question, which ones would you rate as the most important to you? Have your needs changed at all since the beginning of their relationship? Looking at your top needs as well as your spouse's, is there an area that needs more attention? All right, so I will pause here, but look forward to rejoining in just a few minutes. I'm gonna continue blazing forward. And as I like to joke, we can't get through one talk without touching upon some of the differences between men and women. We just showed some variants within emotional needs. And in a moment, we're going to take a look at how these differences affect our sexual relationships. But first, as we switch over to sex, let's take another peek at God's blueprint. Oh, let's see. All right, so as Catholics in the 21st century, we are so blessed to have an amazingly comprehensive manual for sexuality called Theology of the Body. Now this, out of all the topics we've discussed, is one that definitely needs way more than an hour to do it justice. I literally almost feel guilty doing a quick three-minute summary because it is such a deep, beautiful, rich, inspired work that people dedicate entire doctorate programs in order to fully digest and apply. And out of all the resources provided in this series, going deeper into any of the theology of the resources is one of my top recommendations. Because again, understanding God's design is the first most important step to making improvements in these areas. So as some of you may already know or be familiar with, Theology of the Body is based off a series of talks and homilies given by now Saint Pope John Paul II. From these works, we get some really key takeaways that shape how we approach the topics of our bodies, marriage, and our sexuality. I'm going to hit upon a few of the big ones to help guide us through the rest of this talk. Starting with that the body is seen as very, very good. We are not just persons who inhabit bodies. So our bodies are not just shells that house our souls. We are body persons. So my body is me. My body is the very way that I am present to the world, the way that I can relate to others. It's a huge, amazing gift. Also, we say our bodies are male and female, and this reveals something about God's mystery and design. They're complementary, meaning God designed our bodies with this beautiful capacity for union. The male and female bodies are meant to perfectly come together in physical union that signifies a union on every level of the person, anatomical, hormonal, emotional, theological, intellectual, spiritual, even apart from divine revelation, scripture, the church, everyone, if they look, can intuitively see this message written into the body. We are made for relationships. 
And this is not something secondary about us. JB2 says the call to communion, personal union, inscribed in our sexuality is the fundamental element of human existence in the world. Pretty deep stuff. Also, we read in Genesis that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So in other words, when God wanted a picture of himself in the world, he made a family. Because their communion of love that most reflects in this world who God is. In our faith, we also believe that the two shall become one flesh. So there's this self-giving, mutual self-donation that's enacted in our bodies. God also designed sexuality to be life-giving. So therefore, the love between the spouses becomes flesh, so to speak. Their love becomes totally concrete. It's incarnated in a child. And by that miracle, God expands the covenant of love. Now, I personally have a favorite part of theology of the body that I can't help but bring up. JB2 really spent a lot of time unpacking Genesis, again, to help us understand God's original plan. And one thing he touches upon is when Adam has this moment of self-discovery. At last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. When Adam sees Eve, he discovers something about himself. He recognizes, through the complementarity of their bodies, that he can give himself to her as a sincere and total gift. And she can receive and understand that gift and then respond with the gift of herself to him. He suddenly has a whole new understanding of what his life is about. This is why she is called his helper, not because she makes his dinner and brings his slippers. She is his helper because she helps him realize and live out the deepest meaning of his existence, which is to love and be loved and form that communion of persons. Without her, he could be tempted to think his purpose is to tend and keep the garden which represents everything we do, productivity, work, technology, activity, and all the things we could be tempted to think are the highest reality of human life. She helps him realize and live out the very meaning of being human. And likewise, he helps her. So that's a taste of the plan revealed from the beginning. And understanding that vision can help orient us towards what we're aiming for, as well as hopefully dispel any myths or distruths about sex, our bodies, and marriage. And many of us are probably already pretty familiar with the myths that are out there. Most people believe that Christians, and Catholics in particular, have a dim, ignorant, and pleasure-killing view of sex. Even a lot of Catholics have this perception, and to be honest, due to a few contributing factors, this perception is not exactly surprising and understandable. How many people feel like growing up, they got a comprehensive, in-depth teaching and understanding on God's plans and the goodness of sex outside of don't have sex? Usually when this presentation is in person, I ask people to raise their hands and I would say it's the majority of the room that have not had that experience, especially since it's only in the past 10 years that we've really had a rising awareness that rules without relationship leads to confusion and oftentimes to rebellion. If you preach only a bunch of rules, without education on the reasons, which should always have to do with God wanting the best for us and our ultimate well-being, then it sends a message of fear. It creates anxiety around the subject as if something is wrong. It makes sense that you leave people with the impression that something is bad. 
So with all of those no, no, no's, don't, don't, don'ts, it's understandable that we could get the impression that all things sex related must be bad according to the church. This is such a heartache for God because as we just explored, God thinks sex, our sexual desires are good, amazingly good. The first commandment he ever gave us was to go and do these things, be fruitful and multiply. I always think of the uh, Matt Frad joke. He wasn't telling us to grow pineapples and buy calculators. He wants us to come together in physical union. He wants to bond two people together in love. He wants to bring new life into the world. So he designed it. He thinks it's wonderful. God says, do it, but do it in a way that will bless you and satisfy the deepest desires of your hearts, not hurt you. In other words, God doesn't want us to settle for less, or as I like to say, eat out of a dumpster. In the cycle of use that we keep referencing, there are a lot of counterfeits to real love, real intimacy. It's kind of like fool's gold. It looks shiny on the outside, looks like the real thing, but when measured and tested, it's far from the real deal. So using another for pleasure, separating our bodies from our person, and bonding outside of a committed love. We hear don't do these things, but not because God is some pleasure-killing tyrant. God just wants our happiness, our fulfillment, and understands that those things ultimately will hurt us. And compared to what we could be experiencing, it's pretty sad. It's like eating out of a dumpster when I could be enjoying an amazing feast. Something like Chipotle, meets chick fil meets Thanksgiving. Many focus what seems to be the series of no's. But really, following God is meant to be about a big yes, please. But something way better, the real deal, a real nourishing feast of blessings. But there's no question that how I view and understand sex is going to influence or affect my ability to create, prioritize, and engage in a really full, rich sexual relationship with my spouse. So I'm going to take you through what we call the five stages of sexual advancement and highlight what's needed to be able to progress and grow through each stage. Starting with stage one, which is titled the negative materialist. So in this stage, sexuality is viewed very negatively. It's almost feared and treated with contempt or at best begrudging respect. The body is usually seen as almost corrupted and sometimes viewed as the enemy. Usually, this creates a very cautious and fearful lover who gets little personal pleasure from intimacy or perhaps affection even in general. Here, what's oftentimes needed is to reckon with the goodness of the body and sensuality, as we just talked about. So learning more about theology of the body can be a great start. Or if the issue is not ignorance or improper teaching, but woundedness, counseling can sometimes be needed. Often punitive childhood experiences or even real sexual wounds can greatly affect someone's relationship with sexuality. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. Now, stage two is called the positive materialist. Now, they also believe that the body is merely a thing that has little, if any, spiritual value. But they believe that sensuality is good, and they usually celebrate it as such. However, they usually believe sex to be all about pleasure and sensuality. And what's usually missing is an understanding that authentic happiness is found in intimacy and virtue, not mere sensuality. So overall, it's still a fairly shallow philosophy of sex. 
it can only take intimacy so far because it sees exciting sensations over meaningful relationships. And when human sexuality is reduced to mere eroticism, it's only a matter of time before self-esteem suffers and relationships collapse because you're missing all those other levels of, and aspects of intimacy. All right, then we have stage three, the interpersonal stage. And in this stage, relationship sex starts to look good. And this stage actually represents the sexual attitudes held by most average couples in basically happy marriages. Couples in this stage think of lovemaking as a beautiful, important thing to do, something that brings two people together. Definitely the beginning point of meaningful, intimate sex. However, there's often still polarization of a sexual relationship, arguing about how much sex is a fair amount when there's different ideas about lovemaking. And also, because it's still viewed as a pleasant, somewhat important thing to do, it tends to be placed at the bottom of the pile in terms of other important things to do. And exhaustion and stress may be regularly allowed to jeopardize its priority. The hope is to continue to discover the deeper significance of their sexual love. And getting us a little bit closer to this goal is stage four, the humanistic stage. Here, a couple is aware of the close connection between generous service, deep intimacy, and attentive loving in all aspects of their marriage, in and outside of the bedroom. They understand on an experiential rather than just intellectual level that sex is a language spoken by one body and soul to another. At all other levels, sex is something a couple does, while here, it's something they are. So politics and scorekeeping are removed from the bedroom. Lovemaking is to reenact their marriage ceremony and not viewed as another energy draining thing or a nice thing to do, but something they draw strength from. And as a result, they try to give it as much priority and respect as they did on their wedding day. Now, it's really just seasoning and maturity that brings us to the next and final stage, which is called holy sex. Two words you don't usually have put together. In this stage, a couple understands how God himself relates to us through our sexuality. C.S. Lewis once wrote, God lends us a little bit of his reasoning powers, and that's how we think. He puts a little bit of his love into us, and that's how we love one another. And the same is true of our sexuality. God gives us a little bit of his uniting and creative nature. So in other words, God's power is expressed partially in the joy God experiences by loving all things, uniting all things, and creating all things. What we humans refer to as our sexuality is the power God lends us to join him in loving, uniting, and creating, both on a physical level, so love making that could potentially lead to a child, and on a spiritual level, through love making that strengthens the unity of the couple and sacrament. Spouses in the stage of holy sex understand these concepts, and as a result, they experience lovemaking not only as self-revelation, but divine revelation. They understand their sexuality as a powerful tool that can be used to pursue personal growth and sanctification. And we say when a couple reaches this last stage, they become what's termed infallible lovers, which sounds very fancy. And here are some characteristics that start to emerge. Infallible lovers don't think of lovemaking as the thing that we do when we're naked, but rather the way that we celebrate our relationship all day long. It's as much social intercourse as it is sexual intercourse. 
So infallible lovers know that the words their bodies speak to one another in lovemaking will be empty and meaningless unless they refer back to the mutual service, outstanding rapport, and intense desire they share all day long. So there's a great emphasis on service, on the giving aspect of love as much as receiving. And foreplay becomes something they are doing 24 seven with this kind of attitude. We also say that as a result, infallible lovers are able to celebrate, and here's the term, a toe curling, eye popping, mind blowing, deeply spiritual and profoundly sacramental sexuality. A sexual relationship that is both fully sensual and fully equipped to move beyond sensuality so that it become an authentically transformative spiritual encounter. And I hope this officially debunks once and for all the myth that Catholics have a boring or pleasure killing view on sex. Now, as I mentioned, this is sometimes where we take another quick break just to go over a couple of questions. But in the interest of time, since this is our longest talk, I'm just going to read the questions real quick. And like I said, I'll be sending out the slides so you can circle back with your spouse and visit them if you would like. So the first question is, at any point in your life or relationship, have there been sex myths that you have believed? And if so, have they affected your sexual relationship? The next one, looking at the five stages of sexual advancement, which stage do you think you and your spouse fall into? What do you think is needed in order to progress further? Now, all these ideals we've covered sound amazing. And of course, it's certainly the goal in all of our marriages. But in an effort to get there, there are a few other little awarenesses that can help. One is some of the differences when it comes to sex for men and women. So once again, let's take a little peek at the research. Now, as we mentioned earlier with emotional needs, for most men, sexual fulfillment is identified as their most important emotional need. When sex life is suffering for whatever reasons, most women don't realize that for the man, it can feel like a relationship crisis. Popular opinion can often portray males as one giant sex craving with no emotions attached. But this is far from the truth. Men don't tend to describe their sexual needs in emotional terms. And as a result, sometimes women can view their desire for more sex as a purely physical desire or even an insensitive demand. But let's take a look at a quote from one marriage study that over 90% of the male participants agreed with. A man really does feel isolated and lonely more than they let on, even with their wife. But in lovemaking, there's the one other person in this world that you can be vulnerable with and totally accepted and not judged. It is a solace that goes very deep into the heart of a man. It's the moment we feel wanted, loved, and closer to her than ever. Now, we don't have time to go into it today, but studies show that most men are carrying around a very deep sense of inadequacy they're constantly working to fight against. Most men report that fulfilling sex in the marriage is what helps them to feel most loved and desired as well as confident. It's the loudest communicator of being wanted by his wife in the relationship. Consequently, no's can come across as a very strong rejection. No is not no to sex as she might feel. For the husband, sometimes it's hard to have it not feel like a rejection to him. All right, well, what about the women? Well, first we have some physiological differences. Brain scientists explain that because the average woman has less testosterone and other sexually assertive hormones than the average man, she therefore has less of an urge to pursue sex. Now, this doesn't mean that she won't want it or enjoy it once it's happening, 
But speaking it out usually isn't going to be on her mind as much as the man's. Lower assertive hormones equal less cravings for sex, less likely to initiate sex, and also more susceptibility to non-sexual distractions, such as noise from a kid's room, a headache, exhaustion, stress, or leftover thoughts from the day. She is going to be more sensitive to hindrances and feel them more intensely. Guys usually report that sex always provides relief or escape from exhaustion. But many women report feeling as if they need to pull themselves out of exhaustion in order to want to have sex. So in other words, for guys, their sexual motor is pretty much always ready to go. Not necessarily for a woman. Now, once her sexual motor is warmed up and running, she is raring to go, just like a man. But most women report it taking more time and effort. One woman highlighted the challenge as such. She said, it's not that I don't want to make love, but at the end of a long day, my mind is set on a course like a cruise ship headed for port. Port being that quiet bit of space a mom anticipates and the kids are asleep, the chores are done, and the house is quiet. And just when I'm in sight of my port, my hubby rolls over and says, what you doing there? It's not that I don't want to be with him, but mentally, it's like trying to stop a cruise ship that's going full steam ahead and make it turn on a dime. I can't quite turn off the day and do an about face in the blink of an eye like he can. Lastly, we have probably all heard that men are incredibly visual when it comes to being turned on, but it's very different for women. Your wife can find you incredibly desirable and attractive, but still will not be turned on by that alone. For her, sex starts in the heart. In other words, her body's ability to respond to you sexually is tied to how she feels emotionally about you in that moment. If she's not feeling anything in her heart, her body sex switches are all the way over to off. Even if you put on your studliest Superman t-shirt. So a man can still greatly desire his wife, even though she was rude to him this morning. But for her, how you treated her this morning really matters. What's in her heart about you and how she can respond to you sexually meld into one. This is related to our spaghetti analogy. Everything is connected. Insert a little potential for conflict. If there's some emotional distance going on, a man will oftentimes try to initiate sex to make it better and get those feelings of closeness back. Because for him, that works great. But for women who aren't wired that way, if they're feeling serious emotional distance or hurt, sex probably won't fix it and could even exacerbate it. All right, so how can we overcome some of these human sex gaps? Well, to start for, with suggestions for the women. First, we can see man's desires for sex as something that's very much connected to his emotions versus a purely physical animal instinct desire. In other words, just know that when you're responding to his invitations for sex, you're responding to a tender heart hiding behind all that testosterone. If possible, respond with your full emotional involvement, knowing that you're touching his heart. And if responding physically is out of the question because there are certainly going to be the times where this is the case, let your words be reassuring, reaffirming, and loving. Also, get involved. This can help with the ability to turn that ship as the one woman described. Many women report that part of the reason they're struggling is because there are things that are making their engagement not pleasurable or uncomfortable. Communication is key. Remember that need to share for intimacy to exist? Well, this area is no different. Be honest, help each other out so that there's more awareness and an ability to create satisfaction for both partners. 
Now, I really want to take a moment to recognize that there may be some women and men who wish they could respond more wholeheartedly to their spouse's sexual needs, but feel stopped in their tracks for various personal reasons. It's in their relationship, past wounds, past abuse, past painful sexual experiences. This is so very understandable and completely normal. And getting the support that may be needed for healing and working through these things is so important. And every marriage deserves this opportunity to heal more deeply. Also, it's important to say that there could be physical reasons that are affecting things. So if needed, seeking medical help or consultation as well. If it feels like there's an, a block to your ability to participate and engage the way that you wish you could, do seek out that emotional or medical support. You are certainly not alone, and there's a lot that can be done to help in both areas. All right, I don't want to leave the men out. What about advice for them? Well, of course, you want to be genuinely desired by your wife. Try to remember that her lower levels of desire for sex likely has nothing to do with your desirability. The Feldman research I quoted earlier also found that 96% of women wish their husband knew. Just because sometimes I don't want sex as often as he does, doesn't mean I don't love him deeply and find him attractive. So not taking things too personally. Also remember that great sex starts with helping your wife feel happy and close to you outside the bedroom. In one survey, women were asked what their husband could do to help increase the chances that they would want to make love more frequently. And the top three responses were, maintain or increase his level of emotional attention, Create a context where he often shows me the little gestures of love throughout the day. Engage in caring listening and conversation regularly. Remember our last two talks and the need to pursue, 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 and my promise that attentive listening is loving your spouse well. Well, I promise I wasn't making this stuff up. Pursuing throughout the day is that social intercourse leading to great sexual intercourse. Also, 70% of women said that simple helpfulness around the house would increase their interest, if nothing else, because they would have more energy. Remember Gottman, the most famous marriage researcher? He confirms that men who do more housework have better sex lives. After this talk at one church, a priest said, I wonder how many husbands went home and cleaned a toilet tonight. Can't hurt, just saying. All right, so we are winding down. And on our last segment for the night, looking at some of the hot topics when it comes to our church and sex. And the two big ones that affect marriages are contraception and pornography. But before we get into that, we need that blueprint again to touch upon what is the purpose of sex. The reason this is so important is because it then becomes clear why using sex for things that are outside of its purpose or thwarting its purpose causes harm. It's like if I gave my friend a hammer and instead of using it to get their HDTV on, they tried to brush their teeth with it or use it as a jack for their car. It's not going to work. It's not going to accomplish what it was meant to. And worse, things or people could get hurt. So the purpose of sex, to put it simply, is bonding and babies. As we said in Theology of the Body, it's meant to bond in the sense that the couple becomes one flesh. And then their love has the potential to become flesh with a new life. The catechism states that the spouse's union achieves the twofold end of marriage, the good of the spouses themselves and the transmission of life. These two meanings or values of marriage cannot be separated without altering the couple's spiritual life, 
and compromising the goods of the marriage and the future of the family. Now, where the modern world gets a little confused is that they often believe that sex is for pleasure. And those who are having sex, they're just doing what sex is for. They're having pleasure. But that's not quite true. Pleasure is not the end point, according to God. There are a lot of things that have pleasure attached to them. But pleasure is the motive or consequence. It's not the purpose. God tends to attach pleasure to the things that he really wants us to do, things that are necessary for our survival and our happiness. So it's pleasurable to eat, drink, sleep, exercise, sometimes. And it's pleasurable to have sex. But again, that's not the purpose. If we eat, sleep, or do these things just for the pleasure, for getting the purpose, we tend to run into trouble. We have to do these things at the right time, the right place, in the right manner, in the right way. Even though eating is pleasurable, there are probably limits to what all of us should be eating. Six trips to Chipotle in one day is probably not a good thing. Sexual intercourse is pleasurable, but the idea is that we have to seek that pleasure in accord with the nature and reality of its purpose. And it's from this understanding that we get all of the church's teachings on sexuality. They all have to do with using sex for something it wasn't designed for, violating or thwarting its purpose, or just using it for pleasure. For today, as I mentioned, I'm just gonna cover the two that most often affect marriage starting with contraception. And we talk about contraception, we talk about the idea that we are locking God out of his procreative act. As we said before, God gives us this amazing gift in sex. He gives us a little bit of his creative power. And with contraception, we're sort of saying, thanks God, I'll take the pleasure, but I don't want that whole creation of a new soul thing. It's kind of similar to saying, thanks, God, I'll take the deliciousness and pleasure of the food, but I don't want that whole nourishing my body with calories thing, the true purpose. Also, with preventing openness to life, contraception also affects bonding. The reason the church says this is because if sex is meant to be a total act of self-giving, you want to give everything you have to someone you love. When you're withholding your fertility, you're withholding something that actually really belongs there. To withhold means you're not giving of yourself completely. So without necessarily meaning to or even intending to, kind of treats these gifts of life and fertility as if they weren't gifts, but more of a problem or something to avoid. Now, I can't stress enough, there are many good, valid reasons to avoid pregnancy. The church is not saying you must have babies always, and and that's a common misunderstanding or myth. It's just saying that when needing to avoid pregnancy, do it in a way that doesn't violate the purpose of sex or thwart its purpose. For this, we turn to natural family planning. God's design really left nothing out. He built in periods of infertility to a woman's cycle. An NFP has to do with using those times as opposed to others for coming together. Now, I don't have time to do a comprehensive teaching on NFP and how it works, how to practice it. Although I 100% recommend learning more if this is a new area for you. And please feel free to message me afterwards for resources or referrals. But for the purpose of today's talk, I do want to highlight the side benefits of NFP, especially since I can tell you that sex therapists cross cultures, denominations, approaches, they all cite periods of abstinence as the best way to increase satisfaction in your sexual relationship. Endless studies to show this. It's kind of amusing. Surprise, surprise. As we said, God's tools tend to lead to the best possible. 
Now, NFP is not without its challenges, but it's not impossible. And as I said, it does do great things for the marriage. Quick little highlights of some of its pluses. We say it strengthens and builds other areas of affection and showing love. So it helps a couple remember there are a lot of ways to say I love you besides sex. Sex is wonderful, as we've extensively covered, but many couples come to rely on it exclusively as their way of demonstrating affection, forgetting that the other things are just as important. Also, when a couple surrenders their sexual claims to one another for a greater good or purpose, a mutually agreed upon purpose, so teamwork, it makes it clear that more than mere gratification, the relationship is their essential center. And even more importantly, God is their center. This leaves little room for either mate to feel used or taken for granted. Also, suspending lovemaking for a time requires the couple to communicate and solve conflicts rather than what can be a common occurrence, which is sexing their way through problems. And NFP requires there to be, to, to be regular conversations that occur about their relationship status and where they're at in terms of their family, their ability to be open to life, their goals, progress, et cetera. And as we talked about, communication is pretty good for the relationship. All right, last but not least, what about pornography? Why do we say this is something that harms us? Well, first of all, porn is actually about lust, not love. It's a perfect example of this cycle of use. Well, I'm not concerned about someone else's greater good, their path to holiness, our relationship leading towards sainthood, but I'm really just thinking about my own pleasure or satisfaction. Now, more and more, this is becoming an issue that women face and deal with as well. Um, roughly, I would say it used to be that the breakdown was 70-30, so 70% men, 30% women. More and more, that numbers has shifted to 60-40 and more and more closer to 50-50. But I'm going to start off real quick looking at the consequences it causes first for men. We say that porn demasculates a man, meaning it robs him from his ability to be truly masculine. The idea of love as our faith sees it, men, love your wives the way Christ loved the church. True masculinity, take a look at the crucifix. Christ emptied himself for the sake of his beloved. Whereas porn gets it backwards. We say a man learns to empty a lady for the sake of himself. Christ says, this is my body given up for you. Whereas porn says, this is your body taken by me. It also can create a void in a man to be able to be captivated by one woman. So brain sensitization can kind of create an arousal template so that reality becomes difficult to really take in and have stimulation from. And your brain is trained to only become aroused by porn. You're really logically... It's a big word for this hour at night. You change your brain to expect all women to live up to what most likely is a fantasy standard. How long does someone look at a picture? 15 seconds. The expression is sometimes someone could be with their beautiful, beautiful wife, but within a minute, stimulation and arousal isn't quite the same. And as we can tell, this conditions away from intimate relationships. Needless to say, this can greatly affect the intimacy and trust in a marriage. And spiritually, it creates a kind of his capacity to transmit spiritual life to his family being cut off. We also can now scientifically show how porn is every bit as addictive as crack, having all the same consequences, physically and mentally. It's also become incredibly prevalent due to what is titled the four A's. So it's available, affordable, addictive, and anonymous. Now for women, the consequences are very similar. Conditioning away from intimate relationships, 
creating a harmful arousal template, but also causing confusion on what constitutes a healthy sexual relationship. Porn can normalize things such as violence, aggression, and infidelity. And there's no question that pornography is the epidemic of our times. So sadly, it's more surprising if a couple has not had pornography affect their relationship or family at some point in time. And if you're one of those couples dealing with this issue in any capacity, please know you are not alone at all. I will, of course, be sharing some resources at the end, but as I mentioned before, please feel free to contact me afterwards if you have any questions on getting support or assistance. All right, and really to sum up both of these hot topics, contraception and porn, we see they're simply missing what God wants for us, which again, is our deepest desires versus any type of counterfeit. And in these areas, the word sin can get thrown around in our church a lot. And this is a hard word for most people. But when we say that these things are sin, what do we really mean? Well, I absolutely love the origins of this word. It was actually an archery term, meaning to miss the mark. And isn't that so true? Our sin is almost always an attempt to hit something good, something that we are made for, but we're just missing the mark. We're usually searching for happiness, peace, love, as usual, possibly eating from a dumpster. And those counterfeits we discuss, they all promise us these good things, but in the end, very rarely deliver. But here's the exciting part. When we allow God's plan to enter to, into our lives and, and we follow his blueprints, we say we get a bullseye every single time. And I hope this is what our talk has been about. Simply helping us understand that goal, that target a little bit better. And as I said at the beginning, this doesn't mean it's easy but I have never seen a case or a couple where just moving closer in the right direction in our own way doesn't make every aspect of the relationship feel better. And it should, because if there's one thing I hope you take away from our time together, it's just how good your sexuality and intimacy are and the importance of celebrating it as such in your marriage. Well, that's been my goal. I hope we've accomplished it. And before I let you go for the night, as promised always, I wanna show you the resources that were used for this presentation. So the first one is The Seven Levels of Intimacy. That's actually a book written by Matthew Kelly. Then we also have, you know, I mentioned the idea of theology of the body resources. And these are some of my favorites, starting with Men, Women, and the Mystery of Love. Now, this is actually connected to, excuse me, St. John Paul II's Love and Responsibility, which is another one of his great works, but it also touches upon a little bit of theology of the body. Easy, great read, highly recommend. We also have Theology of the Body for Beginners, and then Holy Sex, which is the book that we mentioned talking about the five levels of advancement. And these are some talks I would recommend. I believe all three of these can be found on formed.org, which is a Catholic resource that has a lot of different books and movies and talks. And if you're interested in a free um, account or profile, please feel free to message me. The first one, men and women are from Eden. Then we also have contraception, cracking the myths. Prove it, God, and he did. That's another one on contraception, the woman's kind of change of perception within that topic. And then also some books for the issue of pornography. The first one is The Hidden Battle by Matt Frad. His book, The Porn Myth, which is very popular. Delivered is another great one. And then Detox by Jason Everett. As always, if you have any questions, please let me know. 
I'm just realizing I forgot to make another really important announcement at the beginning about typing your question. I don't see any that came through. So please, as always, there's no expiration. You can message me and we can absolutely connect in the future. But otherwise, thank you all again for joining for this evening. I look forward to seeing you next month for our last marriage enrichment series talk, which is on thriving versus surviving. But before I let you go, I'm just going to do a quick prayer and then wish you all a happy evening. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, thank you again for the gift at this time. As we mentioned before, we just ask that your grace and strength would surround us and sustain us in all of our efforts to take these beautiful truths and wisdom and apply them to our vocations and our marriages. Bless all the souls present this evening. Keep us all safe. And I pray this in your mother's name. With Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, everyone, please have a great evening, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time. God bless. Bye.